Hey, it's Broken Office Chair, a podcast produced by Alternatives. Broken Office Chair is hosted by Alternatives Executive Director, Bessie Alcantara. Bessie is a Chicago native, first-generation Salvadoran Mexican-American who's passionate about dismantling systemic racism. In each episode, Bessie will be joined by her friends and colleagues who are ready to speak candidly about their experiences as people of color in their various professions. In the episodes, they'll address topics such as issues in the nonprofit sector, racial equity, DEI in practice, and much, much more. So stay tuned. All right. So we are back with Xavier Ramey from Justice Inform. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Bessie. It's wonderful to be here. So just for our audience, um, we were talking and we ended up recording midstream. So (laughs) that's what folks are going to hear. The middle of our conversation, because the conversation got too good. So we just jumped in and started recording. So my apologies if some of it doesn't make sense right away, but stay with us and you'll catch up. There are different types of leadership. Mm -hmm. And I believe in servant leadership, meaning that the greatest of these should be the greatest servant of all that leaders take the first hit, bosses take the first cut. And this is one of the challenges of being a um, uh, equity informed leader who believes that the first work that we have is not to take on titles and positions because that's what the diversity movement has convinced us of. It has convinced us that the goal of of liberation uh, is to hold the whip to be the CEO. How many black people are CEOs of Fortune 500s? How many Fortune 500s care about black lives mattering? Mm -hmm. Why would I want to be the captain of a pirate ship? (laughs) Why would I want to do that? Mm -hmm. Like, that's not liberation. Um, But the challenge is when people come into it, they can't tell the difference between a servant-minded leader and your everyday CEO or executive director. They can't tell the difference. And that's why I am insistent on the importance of effective followership, not just effective leadership. People don't even know that they're destroying the Dr. Kings of the world. They don't even know that it's not that the king never said we should walk, it's that you don't have it in you to go the whole 380 days, that you're gonna sit there and say, why can't I just take the bus? It's a bus boycott, Mm -hmm. and it ends when we finish. It doesn't end when you're tired. It ends when we finish, and because if it is still going while you're tired. That is not gaslighting. That is not trauma. That is just hard work. It's just hard. I'm sorry. It's hard. Mm-hmm. It's just hard. And if you don't want to do it, that's fine. But don't say that the goal is wrong or that leaders don't have to lead. Say that you don't have it in you to follow, but you never even knew what, what was required of you. And that's the problem that we're facing, I think, particularly as we usher in all of these, especially women of color, who I have spent too many hours of my professional life at Justice Informed over the last six years counseling, caring for, looking at them cry in their offices. Because the people that have said, we need more women of of color in leadership, refuse to be effective followers. They got those women into position, and then they said, why won't you give me what the empire gives white people? Mm -hmm. And that's just absolutely ridiculous. But it's not even... Yes, the empire gives white people, but it's also like meet all of my needs. Yeah. And that's that. I mean, that's that's part of I mean, that goes back to I don't think we should be doing all of this stuff at work. I think the people your your boss is not your therapist. I can't tell you how many times I've said that. Your boss is not your therapist. Your boss is not your partner. Your your coworker is not your therapist. Let's forget about the power differential. Mm-hmm. Your coworker is not your therapist. Your coworker is not your 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 like your financial manager. Like they're not your like your financial coach. That's not Northwestern Mutual. Like they're not like like we're trying to make more happen in one environment than one environment can produce, and that is fundamentally wrong. Not only wrong in the case of how do we transform spaces. It's unjust when we're talking about people who themselves are holding minoritized identities and are dealing with the effects of structural and systemic injustice outside the workplace and inside the workplace and still choosing to show up, carry the bigger bucket of water and do so in a way that they are primarily serving others while not being served themselves. That is the challenge and compromise of leadership. That is why your average chief diversity officer only has an 18-month tenure. That is why we are looking at this leadership void. It is not because simply we have leaders that don't want to do the work. It's because people do not understand effective followership. 
They don't understand that it is a science. It is a skill. It is not something you do because you're an entry level. Entry level still requires a, a, a modicum of leadership. Mm -hmm. All leadership and followership is a type of leadership. It's understanding where you're actively choosing to be in the space and where you're not. Like I was saying to you earlier, I knew I didn't want to be an executive director when I was being asked to step into that role because I didn't want the smoke. <laughs> I didn't want the smoke. And I could sit there all day and say, it don't pay enough. It don't do this. There wasn't no money in the world you could have paid me to do what I saw my boss doing. Mm -hmm. When I saw him not being able to take care of uh, us, show up for his kids, when I saw him having to have his wife come in there, pick up stuff and drop him off lunch, when I saw how many hours he was up, when I went to his house to drop off, you know, copies of grants that I had written as development director, he's sitting there coming to the door in his underwear and, uh, you know, groggy because he just took a nap at 11 p.m., a nap at 11 p.m. That's mm -hmm. leadership. That's not, and, it, and we can say it's toxic. We can say it's overworking. We can say it's overperforming. But for him, he knew that in order to produce in North Lawndale what he knew could be produced, it wasn't going to happen in a span of eight hours in a day. Mm -hmm. It required what it required. It cost what it cost. It's not even time, though. It's your mental well-being. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of what I do specifically is filtering. You talked about having that shield. Yeah. Filtering so that folks don't, like... They don't feel the full pressure of that injustice. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Because who I'm interacting with on a regular basis sometimes is extremely problematic. Yep. And I think that the funding field and board members and all of that have changed in the last few years quite a bit. So it's not what it used to be, at least not for us. A lot of folks elected to not be a part of our community when we started going in this more progressive direction. Um, but there's still these moments that are taxing. And like, I have to sit here and take a break because it's just like, we talk about uh, the other piece that people don't remember, especially for me as a woman of color, is that I'm taking a lot of these hits when I'm interacting with funders, et cetera, and I'm taking them as a woman of color. So yeah. you're not only... Yeah. insulting me as an executive director you're insulting me as a latina you're insulting me as a woman or whatever my identities are that you are insulting at that moment and then i get to go home and experience the world through that lens <laughs> exactly i don't get to take it off yeah. and relax right yeah. and so like it is this thing that for so many of us um our personal becomes so intertwined with our professional yeah. that you don't you don't know anymore where it starts and where it ends. Yeah. No, I, I think you're. I think you're spot on there, Bessie. Um, the. Um, I think there needs to be a conversation around uh, what what must our expectations be while we are still in this transitional moment. I just want to be clear that when it comes to equity, we are not in the promised land. No. We are in the desert. Um, and if we use that, if we extend that metaphor, the desert was not a place of just scarcity and lack like many people think the desert was a place of necessary transformation of the mind mm -hmm. where you have to learn to put down the expectations the benefits the goals of the place that you were just liberated from you were liberated from a place that is not to go into a new place and replicate that you <laughs> must transform your mind your practices your ambitions what you want may cost the world itself if you take that metaphor all the way through, what happened when um, they had their little gold idol because they were feeling hopeless? What ha what <laughs> what what happened when when they yeah? <laughs> if you want to take that all the way through, it, it's I mean think about I think about this sometimes is you know because people tell me that um, I'm intense. Mm -hmm. um, they tell me that you know I run really fast. I've been told working with me is like working next to the sun. <laughs> I say well, I'm a Leo. <laughs> I'm laughing too though that is really appropriate by the way but I'm laughing because I just recently found out that every once in a while I crash and I sleep like 16 hours a day yeah, same. and uh, I found out that one of my directors loves it when that happens because it gives her an opportunity to catch up <laughs> <laughs> see and, and, and here's the here's the thing so going back to my you know my my sort of mantra of each produces according to their capacity and receives according to their need my my job in knowing that um, I do think that, you know, for this moment in my life, and I do believe it is a season, I have a ridiculous amount of energy, mm -hmm. which also means I have a ridiculous capacity. Everybody's not in my season. Right. In their life. And it's my job to be compassionate, to be empathetic, and to measure myself to ensure that my energy doesn't destroy theirs. At the same time, their speed should not compromise mine. Mm -hmm. Because we still need to run. If I moved at the pace that some people move, we would not have a company. 
Mm -hmm. If I slept when some people slept, because it's not like I'm out here activating as a white man. Mm -hmm. I'm out here as a black man who had no inheritance, a black man who had no blueprint, a black man who watched his father build a social impact consulting company, and he was dead by the time I was 18, who never got all of his contracts paid, and we never had the lawyers to defend us in court, who grew up hungry because of it. For a man who was trying to do DEI work and racial equity work before the words even existed. Mm -hmm. And so when I step into leadership and started Justice Informed, I didn't just start it, like I said, to be some CEO. I started it because my identity, my family needs this to work. Not the money. They need the effect that this company needs to create. They need it to exist. In order for my cousins to be safe, for my aunts to be healthy, for my mother to live, this has to work. And people forget that when they see a title. They forget that. And in the current space we're in, you see how I'm pivoting us into our conversation, Bess? You see that <laughs> skill right there? <laughs> um, I told you I'm serious and I'm goofy at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in, in, in order to be um, effective in this space, and this is one of the challenges of the space, and like I said, you know, the mental anxiety of leading while black is one thing. It is very different to lead in the social impact sector as a man of color and as a black man because you are nearly invisible mm -hmm. and no one says it. No one says it. Um, it is very difficult to do that. Um, and I don't do it because it's fun. I do it because, um, one, I'm good at it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I go back to like, it's okay to say you're dope if you're dope. Give yourself your flowers. Don't concede, don't play small. Um, I'm not small. I know that I can produce incredibly in this world. I also know that, and I'm not saying produce like a production focus, because people right. in social justice spaces, man, they're so like, everything is, well, production is bad. And it's like, man, flowers grow. Is that toxic? <laughs> They're producing. <laughs> seeds are producing. Like, y'all giving white folks too much credit. Y'all giving capitalism too much credit. And getting caught like, up on a wrong thing and getting, getting distracted from meaningful change. Like, everything ain't the ism, bro. Like, everything ain't the ism. Like, we, we still must produce for one another, even to share. That's okay. Um, but I will just say that it is a unique challenge trying to produce um, in this sector, especially in this era, um, in my skin, um, with my identity. And it's something that I'm still grappling with and learning to speak about um, in ways that are healthy and informative. Um, I was listening to a, um, a thing by Felicia Rashad last night. She said, I spent uh, years, pr my prayer was, uh, I always pray, God, sit on my tongue. And I was like, that sounds weird, but okay. <laughs> um, and she was saying, Lord, sit on my tongue so that everything I say is the truth, absent, of arrogance or fear. That's the point. Um, we're in a space and in a moment right now um, where I think it's very, very difficult <laughs> um, to talk about the experience that men of color are having and the experience that we're not having. Um, the way that we are being lumped in with white men without mm -hmm. any of the privileges, benefits, um, or reasons. Um, the very few number of us that are making it. Um, and I think the challenges of the confluences of our, of the, wa the ways in which we're still expected to produce in the personal world, like produce for families, mm -hmm. um, produce for communities, be some archetype that still, I think, in many people's minds, in their minds, are still rooted in a patriarchal understanding of what men are. Um, and demanding that for them, <laughs> um, not the liberation or transformation of mankind, of men, but the ability to get what the empire always gives from men. Um, and that also comes into the workplace. Um, you know, I was, I was a justice informed, I was a, um, one of the few black entrepreneurs until I had a team. And then when I had a team, I became the man. <laughs> and I was like, what? What just happened? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, when did, how did, what? Uh, <laughs> like, all of the nuances of what I face in my day-to-day -day things I talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Like, paying bail for my cousin or, you know, in the last nine months, I've lost four black men. Um, you know, two of my black male mentees were shot to death. 
Um, I've never lost any of the young women I've mentored. They've never been shot to death. They've never been stabbed to death. I've been nearly stabbed by women. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. No, but that was at a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. That was a, a student mm -hmm. um, who felt the license that as a woman, you know, I can, you know, but you can't, you can't hit me back. You can't do this back to me, but I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. um, even pull out a knife and try to push it into my stomach. Right. As a, as a staff member of this organization. And I couldn't, what am I going to do, sue the organization? Right. And, and then you, cripple it? Like, and if you make a mistake while trying to restrain her or anything, a, this is not right. It's a whole right. other thing. It's a whole other thing. And we can't talk. We, we, I, it's not that we can't talk. We won't talk about that. We won't I, talk about it. I, I'm thinking back to our original conversation about this, and I'm like, I think it's a little bit of both. Because what's the first thing I said to you was that this is an interesting topic considering how we're talking so much about the experience of women of color in leadership. Yeah. And you talked about the experience of, um, and I'm paraphrasing, right, so these are not his words, but uh, being silenced in this space because of this idea that if you voiced your experience as a black man, then you're taking somehow taking something away from us as women of color or yeah. black women. Yeah, we need to know how we need to learn how to share space. Um, I do believe that there's an importance on focusing over time. Mm -hmm. um, like I believe that we need to in this moment we need to visibilize and concentrate on the visibilization of women of color and leadership. Like we need a good 15, 20 years of focus. <laughs> um, I'm not saying like two leaders. I'm saying like mm -hmm. we need a generational focus on that, and that's because it it. By focusing for a generation, you create a new normal, an expectation. And that expectation and that new normal creates a safety for those people of color, specifically those women of color in leadership um, that right now mostly white women enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, and th but that takes time to standardize. Mm -hmm. um, this is, this is um, the challenge, though, right? Um, men of color are not white men. And the conversation around men and masculinity is not racially intersectional right now. Mm -hmm. Unless we're talking about personal relationships and like who you're dating and who they're dating and that stuff. But we're talking about the workplace. It's not racially intersectional. Mm -hmm. There are no, I've never, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm in the management consulting space. I'm a black man who works in consulting. I have worked with McKinsey consultants, Deloitte consultants, University of Chicago consultants. I've worked with consultants for the last 15, 16 years of my career in social impact work. I have never, ever, ever had a black male consultant. Never, never, until I became one. And I've never received what I give everyone else. I've never received it. I don't know where they are. I know they're there. Mm -hmm. Most of the ones that I know but have never worked with, they're hyper-capitalists themselves. Mm -hmm. They ain't it for the money. We don't agree. <laughs> right. Right? Like, so from an idea stance, we're not the same. Even if we have the same career and job, we don't have the same goals and vision for our people. There's a challenge there. And, and, and I wish that instead of, at, it's sort of like the churches when they say, like, these young people don't want to, they don't want to know Jesus. And they just, they want to go out there and twerk and tweak and all the stuff. Twitter this and Twitter that. And we can't put Jesus in a tweet. You know, they just they just complaining about young people. You really did sound like a preacher there, though. I'm a preacher's kid. Yeah, <laughs> that makes more sense. Got it. African Methodist Episcopal. My grandma had me up in there two, three days a week. It was rough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, in the church, you hear people complaining about how young people don't show up. And one thing I wish that they would do more in churches is get curious about how young people would be in this space if it was actually welcoming to young people. Mm -hmm. But first, you have to have the idea that perhaps this is not welcoming to young people. Mm -hmm. Perhaps there's a certain group being centered here that is not them. Mm -hmm. Perhaps saying, you need to come, if you're coming in here, pull up your pants. Don't come in here smelling like weed. Jesus don't care if you smell like I weed. I was like, that's how, right. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 whether you come in here smelling like weed, at least you're here, you're listening. There are many um, spaces in the social impact sector that are completely non curious about why there are not more men in the space. I didn't say that they're rejecting. I said they are not at all curious mm -hmm. about why they're not there. And instead, just like the church, instead of saying, hmm, how is this space organized? What is happening here that may not be culturally or specifically attuned to welcome and then engage specifically male-identified persons when they're here, particularly men of color, versus they just don't want to be here. They just don't want what's here, or they're too toxic to come here. They're too problematic, or they're not. There, there's. 
there's something about the way this thing is being built that doesn't speak to them. This brings up for me that study in North Lawnville years ago, what was that, like nine, 10 years ago, that talked about something like 56% or over half, I'll say over half, of black men between 18 and 24, I think it was, that lived in North Lawnville were not in school or employed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, the unemployment rate when I was working in Lawndale, um, specifically with young black boys, um, the unemployment rate was 68%, or sorry, the court involved rate was 68% for black men, 68%. Now, how many of them do you think are gonna be gainfully employed? Right. With 68% of your specifically male population in that space, they're not gonna be gainfully employed. And if they are employed, they're certainly not in a job making $85,000 a year. They're mm-hmm. going to be making more like twenty five, thirty five, forty five thousand dollars a year tops. Forty five if they're lucky. Exactly. If mm-hmm. they're connected, if they're mm-hmm. lucky, if they're br- if they have some background, some connect, like these sorts of things. And so then you 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 lump onto the, this question of like, what do we expect men to produce in the house? Then becomes also a trauma and a trigger for women who have upheld the communities for a long time. Mm-hmm. Right. There is an expectation of companionship and partnership that then be- is is affected by systemic injustice. I told a lot of people that if you want more black, I'll just say specifically as a black man, if you want more black men um, to be viable and valuable partners and these sorts of things, you might have to consider prison abolition. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to be a little bit more civically engaged. I think it was about 15 years ago that I saw a study that North Lawndale specifically uh, was number seven in all of Illinois for uh, prison reentry. Yeah. Yeah, 80% of all of the um, people who are currently held in Illinois prin- uh, uh, prison in, in the uh, Illinois Department of Corrections come from five neighborhoods in Chicago. Most of them are men. You know, mm-hmm. the, 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 the hard thing is, you know, I've, I've been in this sector long enough to go from a conversation about um, we need to uh, protect black boys and we need to think about disciplinary procedures in schools that disproportionately affect these black boys um, I remember the, the last pr- uh, principal at Henson Elementary. I used to work um, specifically trying to, uh, you know, break up lunchroom fights. I was a director of development. I'm up in there breaking up lunchroom fights, serving as ad hoc security guard at the door and these sorts of things um, uh, as a nonprofit staff member. But, you know, I remember the, talking to the, the principal right before Rahm Emanuel closed that school. Um, you know, and he said, um, every boy, not some, every boy that we have suspended in the last six months um, in an out-of-school suspension has been picked up by the police within 24 hours. Every boy. And this is a middle school. I think, yes, protect black boys and also black men. And I think that... Well, they become... Those boys then? This was 2008 and nine. How old? Let's say they're 12, 13 years old Mm -hmm. in 2008. It is 2023. Right, we are talking about 15 years. If they're 12 then, they're 27 now. They're 20, 28, 27. Yeah. Don't ask me to do math right now. I know. Yeah, it's, it's rough out here for us social <laughs> folks. They're, they're, they're 27 years old now, mm-hmm. right? You got 27-year-olds working at Alternatives, right? Mm-hmm. I got some people in their 20s working with me right now. What do you, where do you think those boys are? They are now the young men. I'm just thinking about the, uh, the intersection, again, gender and race, right, and the um, hyper-masculinity perception of black men and how this shows up, right? Men, black men are not take, taking care of themselves, are not being taken care of. Mental health is a huge issue. And what's coming up for me is that I've had a couple of incidents in the workplace where black men literally just like got up and screamed at me. And I had one incident mm. where he came in, he thought he was going to get fired. And he had been in the prison system. And he just came in and went clean off on me in such a way that the other employees that were in the room were about to physically restrain him. And I was like, it's okay. And so I kicked everybody else out and he sat down and I'm like, what's up? What's going on? And he started crying. And that was a moment for me. All of his trauma had been brought up when we called him into a meeting. And, you know, we're supposed to be trauma informed. But how many of us would, I'm thankful that I handled that situation well. And we went on to work really well together. But I'm sure there's a 
ton of situations, mm. way more that I did not handle correctly. And how many of us are sitting here and putting all of our assumptions about what black men should be like, um, the intersection of what the workplace should look like, and then people are doing their best to show up and this experience is not being talked about or normalized and all of this just explodes. I have had that experience so many times, Bessie. I'm sorry that you had it. Um, for me, um, you know, I, I think back one of my mentees who just got killed in June, uh, beginning of the beginning of June, he was uh, shot in the stomach here in Chicago, and um, he was my first mentee. And uh, he was 31 years old mm -hmm. when he was killed. Um, first time I met him, he punched me in the chest. <laughs> That's not what I would think would go into a mentee relationship. But continue. This is this is what I mean by what what is leadership. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what does it mean to serve and love one another? What is required, not what is ideal? Mm -hmm. um, Larry punched me in the chest the first time I met him. He's like, oh, you're the new guy. Well, welcome to YM. It's good to see you, man. What's, what's your job? I'm the, I'm the <clears throat> director of development. I'm <laughs> leading the fundraising strategy, the new capital campaign to build our student youth. Um, I really um, hope you use that voice, too. <laughs> I was so full of myself. Oh, God. Um, and... Um, you know, he kind of chuckled and laughed and all of that. And he just, I mean, just cocked back, blew me straight in the chest, right? And that was a welcome to Lawndale moment. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's the thing. Um, I had a couple options. I can sue my employer, mm -hmm. right, for creating an unsafe, hostile work environment. I could use those words. Mm -hmm. Those are nice little legal words that I had the right to use. I could, I could go to the police department, file a formal complaint of assault against this young man, 16 years old. I could say he assaulted me. I could use words like that, that would attach to his, to his entire life. I could use words like that, and I had the right to do it. Mm -hmm. I could send a letter to the board of directors accusing the executive director of not creating a safe work environment. I could have them dip into the, the insurance fund and try to give me a little settlement or something. I could do all of those things for this little nonprofit that had a $390,000 budget. I could do all of those things. I had the legal right, and I probably could exercise that on moral grounds as well. What did I do? I took my butt to the gym. <laughs> I went to the gym. That's I went to the gym. Mm -hmm. I went to the gym because if I exercised any of those, those things for a black child, if I, I would push him into the penal system, that creates more work for me mm -hmm. from a selfish perspective, and it destroys his life mm -hmm. from his perspective. If I, if I uh, file a formal complaint with the board of directors, I could get this man who's been working in North Lawndale for 20 years, put under a performance improvement plan, maybe even get fired. If I file a complaint and sue the organization, they ain't got the budget to fight me. Right. I could, I could dissolve this entire thing or I could take my butt to the gym. It's not a great option, mm -hmm. but it's the option that is more revolutionary. It is leadership specific to the population I'm dealing with. When that young girl tried to stab me, Pulled out a knife because I wouldn't let her in the youth center. I wouldn't let her in. And she didn't have the emotional or psychological grounding to know that just because you can't get in and you think your brother here and you think I'm lying, it's not a reason to pull out a knife and try to put it in my stomach. And the implications of you doing that are worse for you. Right. <laughs> than you think. What did I do? I restrained her. Mm -hmm. I restrained her. I just grabbed her. She's 11. Mm -hmm. Right? She's 11. Come on now. And think about the fact that she's 11 and that's her defense mechanism. Exactly. Now, here is where the question of where is the empathy, sympathy and curiosity right. about these situations. The situation you were just talking about, Bessie, I wouldn't want any person to be in, especially a woman of color, to be in that situation. And I know it is a different experience for someone who, who identifies as a woman in that space. You have a black man who is physically making himself big, yelling and screaming. Mm -hmm. Like, that is a scary situation. There is no getting around that. That is a real situation, and it is scary. Larry Wright was cussing me out, yelling, when I'm trying to fill out a FAFSA with him. Man, fuck you, asking you, you ain't you know, cussing me out, and the youth center and all of this stuff. And he, nah. Why? I eventually realized he didn't read well. Mm. He didn't read well. Mm -hmm. But because I was patient and sat down with him, me and Larry, man, I got him his driver's license. He was one of my best homies, all the way up until the point where I... Saw him in the casket last month. Mm -hmm. We have to have a different approach when we know our people are not protected in the world. What does protection look like inside our community if we're committing to them? We can't talk about the Larry Wrights of the world or the black man that you're talking about in the same way that we talk about these other men. Mm 
mm-hmm. when we know they're facing something different, even if, it, even if it's coming out in the workplace. My experience was a workplace experience. Your experience was a workplace experience. Things don't just stop happening. Trauma doesn't just go away. People's, in a, you know, the, the, the immaturity or the, the lack of emotional stability or psychological readiness that they should have, which they don't have, mm-hmm. is not going to just happen because we showed up at work. Right. Work is not going to change what injustice refuses to, to do. It's not going to change that. We have to make ourselves ready and stronger to engage, to have an invitation to people, to realize, and this is one of the things that changed my life when I said, hey, if I'm dealing with men of color and I hear anger, I'm going to assume that that's a, a missed expectation. Yes. That there has been my experience. Mm-hmm. There was an expectation. There was probably an experience that they've had in the past. Mm-hmm. If we know also that many men are not, we're not even encultured to socialize, to work through the ability to speak to one another in ways that I think many women are not only um, that they do, um, they're well, incentivized. Like, yeah, like we're encouraged. It's to. encouraged. Like when you go to, to brunch, you don't see a bunch of men sitting around and it's not just because men don't like food. <laughs> <laughs> There's an entire economy that is built right now around women socializing. Mm-hmm. When you go to the like black boat scene, I was at that a couple weeks ago. It was mostly women on boats. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they didn't even own the boats, maybe, mm-hmm. but they own the boats. They socializing. Mm-hmm. They're social, and in those socializations, they're learning how to communicate. They're working through their problems, and then they show up, and they are more emotionally evolved sometimes. Mm-hmm. But there's also a different way that we communicate that I think is being lost in all of this. And there's a lack of communication. I look at this and I say, hey, you know, last year. When all of this, this, this conversation about men that wasn't including men, I just want to be very clear that there are a lot of conversations happening about men right now that aren't in any way including men. Mm-hmm. When I ask a, a, a lot of women to identify, for, have you ever been to a panel that was just men talking about, oh, I would never go? It's like, you would never. Like, <sighs> so you refuse to listen. Mm-hmm. You have no curiosity. It's not just, the problem is not just the problem you, you think it is. There's something there. But first, you have to say there's something worth chasing. When I was growing up, young, when I was younger, you know, to be, to be real plain about it, I grew up in, 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 in the Garfield Park area, uh, sort of on the North Lawndale border. The only people around me were black. Who were the people who were chasing me? Black. Who was trying to recruit me into gangs? Black. Who were the people beating me? Black. When I was getting chased in that car down Cicero Avenue and they're shooting at me, who was doing that? Black folk. When I was held up, put in an in a, in a, in a alley, and robbed at gunpoint, who did that? It was black people. Do you know what it takes to, for me to love my people? It takes an insistence on chasing an idea that they were acting out of an affect that they were not fully aware of and not able to control, and that there is something precious and there is something beautiful and there is something redemptive about my people that I chase incessantly, because I'm also my people. And even though I have specifically been hurt by my people, I love my people, but I have to choose to love. I'm not just gonna fall in love with them. I have to walk and stand and run into love with them because the ways in which the systemic injustices of the world create the, the, the inhumanity that we often place against one another as black people is something that could drive me from ever wanting to be around us and me. Mm -hmm. So I have to chase into love with them and into love with me as a black person. And I'm saying the same thing about men. The hurt is there. The reality, the greatest threat on earth to women is men. Mm -hmm. The greatest physical, emotional, psychological, workplace, school place, playground, swimming pool, beach threat (laughs) to women on earth people who have the identity that I hold and I am saying we still must chase one another we have to be curious about one another despite our harms despite our hurts there's a love ethic that I bring into the social justice conversation the same one that I say about white folks that Miriam Kaba challenged me on said Xavier if, if you want to be a police prison abolitionist if they put down their guns is your heart ready to receive them mm-hmm. or do you think you're just gonna put them on an island somewhere you just gonna kill them? What you gonna do, X? What you gonna do? They're gonna be here in our community, in this community. And all you're gonna think about is what they did. But you're gonna have to find a way to love. That is hard. And Miriam pressed me. 
it hurt to think about that I had to somehow grow my capacity to love like that, that I couldn't just get revenge. I couldn't just tell them to go away. I couldn't just hold them responsible for what they never gave me. I couldn't tell them they were wrong for what they did. I had to find something and dig deep inside myself to say, not just for me, but for us. I must love. What work? Like, I have so many voices in my head of folks who are so impacted by trauma yeah. just saying, you're asking for a lot. That's not my response. I know I'm asking for that. I told Miriam the same thing. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot, right? <laughs> She's the godmother of prison abolition. She told me the same thing. I'm like, Miriam, that's not, no, 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 no. They, they attacked me. I was thrown against the wall. People, tr they tried to pin a, a, a Grand Theft Auto on me. Uh, the first time I was ever arrested, I was seven years old. And they said it was for, for, for uh, 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 illegal operation of a motor vehicle because me and my brother were riding on a lawnmower when I was seven. I have all the reason and right in the world, I think, to say, man, forget them. F12, I have all, and I will never say the real words F12 out loud because I know that that doesn't create the love we need. I will still use the language of invitation with people that I protest against. My brother was the superintendent of police. So, and I'm sitting here saying this while still inviting him. <laughs> that dynamic. Um, <laughs> what I'm asking, though, is what work did you do to get there? Because you didn't get there. You, it wasn't like no, this she ain't challenged player. you. <laughs> this she ain't didn't challenge you like sold, right? Like, what did that work? Because that work had to be hard. Um, the first step is to get curious and to, to, to choose a different mental paradigm of saying, ah, I think there's something there. I think there's something there that I'm missing. Not that they're missing, that I'm missing. The first thing is, and this sounds hard, is personal responsibility. I have a role to play in this. What is my role? Even if they will not, I mean, when, 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 um, when Martin Luther King says, um, fear does not cast out fear, love casts out fear. Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. Do you actually believe it though? And if you believe it, do you know what it takes to do it? I also like to do the question of, do you believe that people are inherently good? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there is that question, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's the, the question, the, the, the work starts with the question of what is the paradigm upon which you will now operate your community integrity right. and your community values. Some people's community values are leave me alone, do you, I'm going to do me, and I'm going to focus on my fam and the people I choose. That's their entire way of integrating into community. Right. Some people have a, 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 a I am not unless we are approach, mm -hmm. right? Some people have a, each person produces according to their capacity and receives according. We all have these different definitions about what we think we should be doing with one another and how we should be responsive and responsible to one another. And that impacts the question of whether you are capable of doing what I'm saying I have already been still working on. I am not done with this work. I have not forgiven everything that happened to me in North Lawndale. I am still not by, in my late 30s, and unfortunately it wasn't until I took on the work of leading Justice Informed that a lot of those traumas that I experienced when I was in my teenage years, those runnings, that sense of fear, that rapid heart rate, that cortisol release, all of that kind of stuff started coming out in my late 30s. And that mm -hmm. created this intense need for me to be in these mentally safe spaces. And that also exacerbated the reality of feeling so alone in the social impact sector that is 76% staffed by women who did not see me as a man of color and didn't specifically understand that I am not a white man and don't have their privileges. But right. I was being talked about and treated as such. Mm -hmm. Like all of that happened at the same time. It requires <laughs> an incredible insistence that there's more for me. I have to insist, I have to continually remind myself that there's something here. There's something here that I'm, maybe I'm missing something. I feel some type of way about something that was said to me. Maybe it's not about what was said to me. It's about what has been said to me in the past. This thing that just triggered me in the office. One of my team members, I have to be very careful with this because I have team members. All of my, there's, there's no black straight men on my team. Mm -hmm. None. Our, like I said, our sector doesn't have a lot of me. Right. When one of my guys came from Garfield Park to my annual client appreciation event last year, we had all of our clients. We rented out the Bronzeville Winery, uh, Eric's spots and Cecilia spot. We had all these people, our community partners there. And one of my guys from Garfield Park came and said, X, what did you build? Nobody here is like you. Did you mean to build it like this? Mm -hmm. Like there's you're the only one here like you. How do you feel? And my brother checked me on that. 
Mm-hmm. And it sent me spiraling because I was like, man, you're right. <laughs> right. Like, there's nothing here for me. What is honoring the, the Paul Ramey that I put in the ground in 2004 when I buried my dad? What is honoring specifically him as a black man from Lawndale here in what I'm doing? I'm in solidarity and service to everybody. But are they and in any way do they truly see me? And I step back and I said, no, they don't. They don't. I don't hear it in the language. I don't see it in the practices. I don't see any time. It, it's just it's just. It's a life in solitude and, and servitude. And, and like I said, servant leadership is real, but there should also be a protection and a service to the leader. We carry the water together and for one another. The future liberation of the world is just not one where men carry all the water or white people carry all mm-hmm. the water, straight people carry all the It's where we are equitably carrying the water, but men are definitely supposed to be carrying more to repair the spaces where women have been carrying for generations or excluded from even owning a bucket. Right. <laughs> The same thing goes with the straights. The same thing goes with, with white folks. The same thing goes anyone who has this generational privilege has the responsibility, I believe, and I know many people mm-hmm. would disagree, they have a responsibility to get that big bucket and carry some water. Mm-hmm. They need to lighten that load. And we should not be expecting of people who have not had the historical protections or the present opportunities to step meaningfully into places of safety economically or socially or even personally, physically, like we're talking about with you, mm-hmm. like with women in the workplace, not even physically safe. Like we can't expect that. And there is more. But we are all supposed to be carrying water. It's interesting because I think we have a similarity in that we have privilege in sitting in our seats. We had a good combination of factors happen that got us here. Yeah. And one of the things I try to make people aware of is that just because I made it here doesn't mean it needed to be that hard. And That's those, right. And That's those right. barriers that I was able to overcome because yeah. I had other privileges, even though I wouldn't consider my background privilege, but I had my mother was involved. I had different things that helped me be successful. Yeah. It shouldn't be that hard for anybody and somebody should not be faulted for not being able to overcome those barriers because those barriers have never been there to begin with yeah no that's real um i think one of the other dirty challenges of this is where um along the way like i think about my the way i speak right now um the way i speak right now i speak because i insisted on doing it right i speak with this sort of elocution and, and, and the, the, the way I speak English is something mm-hmm. that I know that is also open doors for me. Um, I spent years studying language instead of studying what people thought I should have been studying, which was basketball, because I'm a six foot five black man <laughs> from the hood. Right. And everybody thought the only thing I was good for was my body. And I was, they would say, you're a waste of height. And I would say, I wasn't born to play. Mm-hmm. I was born to think. Um, I was in poetry classes. I was a, a national slam poetry champion twice. Um, I was on the chess team as the captain. You know, I was in musical theater on stage, right? I was always this sort of gender-breaking straight dude, mm-hmm. um, racial expectation-breaking black dude. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, um, I've always been that weirdo, um, but also I've also insisted on certain things that others didn't insist on. And that give me not just privileges, they give me access into spaces. But here's the dirty, see, that's why I say it's a dirty challenge. So then you struggle with authenticity. Mm. those people that chose not to speak how I speak man they got I see now at 30 so I'm going to be 38 next month they got well f- developed friend groups that I don't have of people who just said we're going to be about our culture and us I spent my whole life assimilating and the fruit of assimilation is a very lonely tree mm-hmm. and that is real and so I look at it and I say, yeah, there's some privilege. And, look, 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 and I'm also saying like, yo, there's a value, but there's also a cost here. Mm-hmm. Like the doors I'm in are in because I contorted myself. The places and platforms I speak on, like, people see me as some, you know, global keynote speaker and all this stuff. I'm like, that's be- not just because my mom was like, speak English and these sorts of things. It was because I insisted on doing it because I saw I'm not going to get as much in the world as committed to white supremacy if I don't do this. So I'm going to choose to remove authenticity as a value or as a right in my life. And I'll figure that out later. And that's what I've been figuring out now. But I'm just saying here on the other side of this, this road of look at all these things that have been built, look at all these privileges and opportunities. I'm just saying like, there's a cost. There's a real cost. Um, there's a cost personally that I feel deeply and mentally. I don't think anybody in leadership would disagree that there's a cost. Everybody's cost might look different. But you just said in leadership. Mm-hmm. And you know what though, in life. 
to accomplish the things that you want. Well, I, I, I said that because I think that when people see platform, mm -hmm. they assume that there's not a cost. When they say privilege, they assume that there's not a cost. And I'm saying this because we're talking specifically about people of color mm -hmm. and how we need to be real nuanced yes. about how we are not the same as people who are white mm -hmm. and that the, the roads for us to get there are not the same roads. Uh, the, 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 the life ain't been no crystal stair. Um, mm -hmm. What it took, what it took, the, the, the years I had to show up in board meetings, I, I, I can't tell you how many men I've buried, how many boys' bodies, and, and men specifically carry the boxes. We carry the boxes to the grave, and I can't tell you how many bodies I've carried and then walked into work the next morning. This was the comment I made earlier. You don't belong to yourself. No. I, I, I also say often and people think have a reaction to this I was like you also don't get to have feelings in the same way nah nah especially not emote them right and so it doesn't matter what happened last night or even what happened 10 minutes ago if I'm coming into this meeting with whoever I have to be on so like this pushing through thing yeah. is a real skill yeah, but but it's also one and this is why I said leadership is real and it, I think that sometimes people who don't affect practice effective followership in a community-minded, collectivist economy and social environment, um, when they don't have those goals, they don't let you be fully you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's the thing. Like, like you know, it, I just lost another one of my friends last week. Like, I'm always losing people. I'm mm -hmm. always losing people. She was 37 years old. Beautiful sister. Ghanaian sister died of cancer. Um, uh, Sina Giwa. And we went to high school together. And I was sitting there, um, I was in Seattle a couple days ago, and um, I got a text from one of our mutual friends. It's like, Axe, I got really bad news for you. Um, our beautiful sister Cena has passed away. And my whole like countenance immediately shifted because Cena was, I just, we were just hanging out in Ghana in Accra back in January, you mm -hmm. know, um, doing it up. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <sighs> and I thought to myself, um, do I have any time to grieve? We are trying to transition justice informed right now. We are taking on massive risks to do a huge change management strategy right now in this company. I have sales meetings that I need to get to. <laughs> I have um, decks that I need to finish up with my team. I have reports I need to approve. I have like yesterday an entire half day session with a 120 person nonprofit to lead. I have deals that we still need to close. I have, you know, um, uh, receivables and expenses that I still need to uh, account for to our bookkeeper. Like I have stuff to do and I just lost my sister. And it took me back to the month before when I lost Larry and I was like, do I have time for this? It took me back to January when I lost my stepdad and he died. Do I have time for this? Messi, there's nothing about the way that we are practicing work at work or the way in which we are not practicing true community as people who work together that allows for leaders to grieve. Grievance policies, when we write them, I wonder if they're for me. When we're talking about, you know, uh, paternity, maternity, family leave policies, I wonder if they're for me. How would the team, how would this place work without me running this pace? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, when we talk about the question of PTO and vacation and, like, I, I'm supposed to be having, by Justice Forms, I'm supposed to be having a sabbatical because it's my sixth year. And if you hit six years at JI, you get three weeks sabbatical. That's not even a sabbatical. That's just a vacation. I know. <laughs> But it's, it's three weeks extra on top. You can add your PTO oh, to yeah. it if you want. Mm -hmm. um, I just got that from Alternatives, too, actually. But it's, it's, it's is that for me, too? Mm -hmm. Like, there's a leadership issue there. You know, mm -hmm. and most of the conversations I've had, you know, internally, even about, like, family leave, nobody ever says, like, it's very rare that I hear people say, like, we need to make sure that dads are included. Very rare. At the whole time, the, the whole public conversation right now has, no, it's like, there's never a conversation about it. that's why I, I hate Father's Day not because I hate Father's Day but because it's such a joke it's such a joke one of the, I don't have kids right now and I know you know it's still debate I was like I just don't think this world cares about dads I don't say I hear I happy Mother's Day to, happy Father's Day to the moms and I was like 
there are real dads like that. My dad was in my life. He mattered. Mm -hmm. He made a difference. If you didn't have a dad, it's not saying that you're less than. It's just saying that there is a difference there. And that difference is not to say that you're less than. It's to say that there's simply a difference. Mm -hmm. And I, I am a living proof of the difference, though I only had 18 years with my dad. I know there's a difference because I have a brother, my brother Dorian in Virginia, who didn't grow up with that dad. Because that dad wasn't allowed to be in his life. Mm -hmm. by court order and all types of stuff though he kept trying to go and be with his son he, every time he show up you know the courts say you know call the police on this man it's a man it's a tall six foot seven black man can't show up you know these like this stuff is real and i think this is also what i'm saying here and i know that was a little bit um off but i, I was saying that because there are real things that 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 men of color see and experience that are in no way right in no way fair where we are villainized and made to be the victimizers in situations through narrative that then remove us from our homes, remove us from the workplace. And then when we are asked to show up and produce something that only white men have ever had the safety to produce, we are then held accountable for that and then talked about but rarely ever talked with. Black men were not allowed, and we know what happened with social workers. We know that, that men, the way that their food stamps and, and, and income supports work, men were not allowed in the house if a woman was to re receive income, certain types of income supports. Black men were pushed out of the home. If we know that the war on drugs disproportionately affected black men, if we know that to be true, and we know that that stamp on them, the, the Ban the Box campaign didn't even start and get steam until 2010. If we know that the death penalty was real in Illinois until the early 90s, and if we know that there are these men sitting on death row, if we know that the morgue is full of black boys who never made it to 16, if we know that my life expectancy as a black man in Cook County who was born in 1985 was 56 years, and I don't know one six foot five black man over the age of 75, not one, and I think every day about my mortality, because I don't see us living, and then I show up to work, and I'm talked about like I'm a white man. I show up in the world and on the podcast and all of the pie, all of this. It's just men. And it's just like, y'all got to be more intersectional. Mm -hmm. We're not leaving homes because we wanted to. We weren't allowed in the home. <laughs> We're not in these higher paying jobs because we don't want them. We got we have backgrounds like this is not just personal. This is systemic, too. So my close out question. Yeah. What would you want to see from folks? Sympathy, empathy and curiosity. That is the start of any great relationship. Be curious, be curious about men. Please be curious for our sake and the sake of your families. Don't just love boys, love men. Don't just demand that boys be safe. Know that the men weren't ever. Don't just ask why aren't they here. Say, what is it about here that isn't for them? Be curious, be curious. The same way that I am about black people that pushes me not to fall in love with them, but to walk and to run into love with them though they have been the main ones that have hurt me. I know there's something there. Why? Because I am one of them, too. I feel like this is perfect for your Lenny Williams closeout. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> but before we get there... I cannot... Okay, so that was a surprise for me. <laughs> so you just got me to do what I was doing to you. Like, I'm on this serious thing, and you just bust in with Lenny Williams because I love your song. I mean, you set it up so oh perfectly. Oh, my gosh. I wasn't even there, Bessie. That was good. That was good. See, that's the thing about Leo. It's like, we're not offended. We love a good quality anything, including a joke or insult, or as long as it's quality. <laughs> It could be a distraction, a diversion, but that was good. But before you, you know, close us out, where can people find you online? Uh, people can find me at www.xavierramey.com. Uh, you can find me by searching on YouTube, Xavier Ramey Chicago. You can go to justiceinformed.com to learn more about the work that I and my incredible team get to do every day to advance social equity in all types of organizations. Uh, and then you can also find me, especially on social media, on Instagram as Xavier.Ramey or on LinkedIn if you just search Xavier Ramey Justice Informed. Thank you. Sorry, you're going to close those out Thanks, or not? <clears throat> Girl, you know how, 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 how I love you. No matter what you do. That's the kind of love I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> and I He's hope you understand me. Everything that I say is the truth. Because I love. That's off. Love you. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm done. Cut him off. <laughs> We have to redo the intro. No. <laughs> That's the closeout. That's perfect for a closeout. So a quick intro. So I'll just say we're back. Thank you for being here. I'm going to actually say that we started recording mid-conversation because it was too good. So sorry. You're picking us midstream. Yeah. All right. So. Do I need to introduce myself again or no? Yeah. We're welcoming you back because we didn't do that. They just started recording. Are we welcome? Is this going to be a separate episode? Or? It's going to be the part two. Okay. So it's going to be a separate episode, part two, but people should just already know you from the first one. Mm-hmm. That's a big assumption. I can cut in your intro. intro. Oh. Yeah, okay. we can do that. Okay. To keep up with everything going on at Alternatives or to donate, you can visit us at our website, alternativesyouth.org. You can also follow us at Alternatives Inc. on Instagram or at Alternatives Youth on Facebook. If you want to keep up with Bessie, you can follow her on Instagram and TikTok at Bessie underscore Alcantara. Broken Office Chair is hosted by Alternatives Executive Director Bessie Alcantara. It's produced, researched, and edited by Catherine Best and Deanna Phillips. Thanks for listening.